So now once Joy is installed, we can actually go ahead and create an object schema. So I'm going to create a new folder. We're going to call it schemas. Now this one is not going to refer to GraphQL schemas. This is going to refer to object schemas for Joy. So we can create a definition for user. Let's go ahead and import Joy from Joy. We're going to export defaults and object schema definition. So we can actually call joy.object. Once we call that method, we can provide a set of keys to the keys method. So actually, let's go back to our model. What I'm going to do is I'm going to copy the email address, username, name, and password. Let's go ahead and put them in here. Now the email address is going to be a string. So we can go ahead and call joy.string. This one is going to be an email address. So we can call the helper email method. We can also tell joy that this field has to be required. And then lastly, we can also provide a special label property because by default, it's going to be the key itself. So it's going to be lowercase email. In this case, we want it to be capitalized. So let's do email like this. Now for the username, this one is also going to be a string. In fact, just like all of them. So let's call the string method. We're going to make sure that the username is alphanumeric. So we can call the alpha num method. We could tell it to be at least four characters in length or maximum of let's say 30 characters. Once again, we can also make it required. So let's call the required method. And we're also going to assign a label just like we did with the email address. In this case, it's going to be username. So let's do exactly that. Now for the name, this one is gonna be a string. So let's do joy string. We could tell it to be a maximum of 254, for example, required. And then for the label, let's say we're gonna have a name like this. And this one could be a full name, so first name and last name. Now for the password, let's do a joy string, not strict, but string. And in fact, what we can do here is we can pass in a regex expression. Now for something like this, we could switch back to Google Chrome. Let's do a quick search for regex for password. Let's look for something on Stack Overflow. And we can go ahead and open the first one. So if we look at some of the answers here, if you scroll down, you're gonna find an answer to check for a password that has at least a lowercase letter an uppercase letter, a digit, as well as one special character. So we could go ahead and copy that expression. Let me go back to my editor. And just to have something working very quickly, we're gonna paste in that same expression. In this case, the only modification I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change this parameter over here. So we're gonna check for length between eight and 30 characters like this. And then the label field, I'm gonna call it password like this. So once we export this object, let's also go ahead and create a barrel file. So it's going to be an index.js. So let's do an export default of, let's say, sign up, because this is going to refer to the sign up mutation from user like this. Now going back to our resolvers, what we can do in this case is we can actually go ahead and perform validation inside of the sign up mutation. So let's first of all import joy, import joy from joy like this we're going to do is we're going to call joy.validate method. What this one is going to expect, the first argument is going to be the input. So the actual object that we want to validate. And the second thing is going to be the validation schema. So we're going to pass in the sign up schema that we've just created. So let's actually go ahead and import it. I'm going to do import sign up from we have to go one level up schemas like this. And this method, in fact, is asynchronous. So we can actually go ahead and call await on it. And because of that, I'm going to also add async keyword in front of the function like this. So let's actually go back to our terminal. I'm going to do a yarn dev to start the server. So we're going to try to fire off a mutation. So let's write up a sign up mutation. We're going to pass in an email address. Let's try and pass an empty email. If we try to ask for an ID, of course, this is going to fail, but it's not going to fail because of joy. It's actually going to fail because of built in GraphQL validation. In this case, we're missing a bunch of arguments. So we're going to pass in the username. Let's do an empty string. Let's try name, same thing, and also password like this. Now let's see if this is going to pass the validation. And of course it fails. Now we get only one error in this case, even though a lot of things are failing. So for example, the username cannot be empty. The same thing applies to name. The same thing also applies to the password. But in this case, we're only getting one error message. And that's because by default, joy stops validating after the first validation failure but we could actually customize this behavior by passing a special abort early flag and we could set this one to false like this so if i save it and if i try to rerun the query once again 
we're going to get a bunch of validation errors. Now, in this case, you could see that the regex for the password actually gets dumped out. What we can do in this case is we can actually go ahead and customize the error message. So going back to the user schema, what we can do is we can call the options method. We could pass in the language key. In this case, we're targeting the string method. And then we're going to target regex after it. Now, the one thing that's special about the regex object is that we also have to pass in a special base property. But once we do, we can actually specify a custom message. So for instance, password must have at least one lowercase letter, one uppercase letter, one digit and one special character like this. So if I fire off the same query once again, you could see that the error has been customized like this. So at least we're not exposing the regex to the client. So let's try providing a valid input. So I'm going to do alex at gmail.com. The username is going to be alex996, for example. For the name, we're going to set alex. And then the password, well, we could try secret 12 exclamation point. So let's try saving that. Seems like the user has been saved. Now to double check, you could either use the MLAB user interface, but what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to open up a new terminal session. From then on, I'm going to try to connect to MLAB using the mogul client, which you could actually install separately. If I run help, we can actually see a bunch of options that are available to us. So things like host or port. So I'm going to try connecting to the chat database. I'm going to pass in the host as well as the port. In this case, we're connecting as the admin user and also provide the password separately. And then the last argument would be the authentication database. So in this case, we're authenticating against the chat database. So let's try running it. I'm gonna provide my password and it seems like we are now connected. So let me try DB, we're connected to the chat database. I'm gonna do show collections and we get the users collection. So in fact, now we could do DB users.find. Let's see if we have anything in there. We could also do pretty on it like this. And as you can see, we get one user. And in fact, this is the user that we've just created. The only problem right now is we're not validating for uniqueness of fields. So for example, we already established that the email has to be unique. And the same also applies to the username. So in fact, if I try to rerun the same query, it's going to succeed and it's actually going to create a new user instance. Now that's a problem. So we're going to try to work around that with mongoose validation. So inside of a model, let's say for an email field, we can actually pass in an object and we can also specify the type. So this is going to be a string just like before. But if we switch back to the validation section, mongoose actually allows you to define custom validation logic. So let me look for custom validators. So as you can see, you can define your field that you can pass in the validate option with an object. We can have a validator as well as a message. So let's try to do exactly that. And back in our editor, we're going to have a validate property with an object. In this case, the validator could be a function. So we could either use a traditional function if we care about the this keyword, if we need to have access to it. But in this case, it's actually going to be the document and not the query. So we can't go ahead and try to do a query inside of this function. But what we can do instead is we can actually pass in a closure. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pass in an arrow function. This arrow function is actually going to accept an email address like this. Now, what this function is going to do is it's going to try to perform a query on the user model. But because the user model has not been created yet, we're actually going to pass in a closure function. What I'm going to do is I'm going to separate the last statement. We're going to do an export default of user. And then the user is going to become a constant over here. So this one is going to refer to the actual user model. Because this function for a validator is going to be a closure, we could actually go ahead and have access to the user model like this. So we can call the where method. In this case, what we're trying to do is we're trying to check if the email field is actually unique. So it hasn't been duplicated yet. So we're supplying the email property. This one's going to, of course, expand to email colon email. And then we could try to do a count on it. So we could do a count on that query. In fact, count is going to give us a deprecation warning. So instead of count, we could do count documents like this. And then at the end of it, we can also check if that count equals zero. So the premise for this validation is to check whether the count of users with this email ID, in fact, equals zero. So we're basically checking if the user with a given email address exists. Now, if they don't exist, then the validation is going to pass. 
but if the email already exists in the database, that means that the email has already been taken. So we can't reuse it again. Now, in this case, because this operation of counting the documents is asynchronous, we also need to make sure we pass in the await keyword. So in this case, we can make the whole function asynchronous like this. Now, the second argument, of course, would be the message. Now, looking back at the docs, in fact, what we could do is we can pass in a message as a function. It's going to receive an object with the value provided by the user. So let's do exactly that. We're going to extract out the value from that object. We're going to pass back a string with backticks. We could say email. We could inject the email inside of it and say email has already been taken like this. And in this case, we could either call value and email like this, or we could basically just use the value directly. Now, the injection of this value, of course, has security implications, especially for XSS attacks. So I'm going to go ahead and leave a to-do note for security to come back and fix it later. So once we have this check in place, let's try to go back to our playground. So if I try to execute this query once again, we're going to get an error message because the email has already been taken. But if I try a different one, let's say max at gmail.com, if I run it, as you can see, the user gets created. Now, once again, to recap this, what we're doing is we're creating a custom validator on the Mongoose model. We are performing a count of documents using the given email address. Now, if that email address matches an existing user document in the user's collection, then that check is going to fail because the count is going to be one. And that's why we're going to get a validation error message. But if the check is false, then the validation is going to succeed and we're going to insert the record to the database. So if we go back to the terminal, we can in fact check to make sure that the object has been created. Now, we probably also need to have the same check for the username. In fact, we could just basically copy it. So let's put in the object. In this case, we're going to be checking by username instead of email. And of course, we could say for the error message, username has already been taken. Now, as you can see, doing the validation with the count is repetitive. So what we can do is we can instead create a static method on the model. So we can go ahead and scroll down a bit and do user schema. Let's access the statics property. We're gonna create a special method. Let's call it don't exist. In fact, this one is inspired by the same method in the eloquent ORM in Laravel. But this one could basically be a traditional function. So what we can do is we can expect a set of options to that function and we can return this dot where so we could pass in the options inside and afterwards we could basically do a count of documents on that query. Now in this case once again we're using a traditional function that's because we need to have access to the this keyword and once again we're going to put in a wait in front of it and we're going to do async on the function. So now instead of doing a count twice, what we could do is we could basically call user dot doesn't exist as a static method and we can go ahead and pass in a set of options with the username inside of it or for the email address, we can also pass in the email, of course. So let's do exactly that. I'm going to pass in the email. In this case, the functions don't need to be asynchronous because we already have async await in the method itself in here. So once that is done, let's go back to our browser. I'm going to try to insert the same record with the same email address. And we get two error messages because both the email address and the username has been already taken. But if I do, let's say joe at gmail.com, and if I run that, we're going to get an error because the username has been taken. And once again, let's try Alex. We're going to change from Alex996 to Alex12. In this case, the email has been taken, and that's why we get that error. And once again, of course, we get the same validation as we had before with Joy. So let's say if I try passing an empty string for a name, of course, this one is going to fail. But it's going to first fail at the Joy level and not at the Mongoose level. So let's pass Alex. I'm going to try alex10 at gmail.com. Let's do that same username. So let's try inserting it. And as you can see, the user gets created. So once again, to recap, we're using a custom doesn't exist method that we define as a static method. That's why we have to access the statics property. We're doing a count of documents based on the provided options. In the case of the email, it's the email address. And with the username, it's actually the username field. So that's basically it for validation in GraphQL. Now, as I said, there's different approaches for doing validation. Once again, 
nothing stops you from basically combining these different approaches. So as you saw, we used joy for object schema validation. So it's very expressive and readable. And in fact, it's very pleasurable to work with. But of course, you could combine it with something like Mongoose validation, which comes out of the box. And with Mongoose validation, it might make more sense to put in data driven validations. So for example, doing queries inside of your custom validators. So something like that might as well be defined on the Mongoose model itself. So that's pretty much it for this video. I hope you found it useful. In the next one, we're going to have a deep dive into authentication. So I hope you stick around for that and I'm going to see you next time. Take care.